This is J.G. Hertz, the General Mar Talker on Deep Space Nine, and you're listening to Trek FM. Welcome, Niners, to another episode of The Orb, our dedicated Deep Space Nine show. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me, as he always is here on The Orb, is my esteemed co-host, Matthew Rushing. Matthew, you know, it's been so long since we've gotten together in here. It looks like, uh, I think, Quark's rolled out a few flags for some different people, and and, uh, personnel's changed a little bit. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, there's uh, apparently, I think, some new Dabo girls. I feel like we've got a, you know, a brand new bartender, which I didn't really catch his name, but uh, he's he's still serving the good stuff. So uh, very excited about that. I'm picturing that new bartender being Brunt because I, I'd love <laughs> to see him put into that role where he has to actually serve drinks in the bar instead of coming in to harass Quark about Latinum. Well, you know, uh, honestly, uh, after uh, what happens uh, at the end of Deep Space Nine, I think he kind of deserves it. So I'm all for that. (laughs) Well, Matthew, it has been a while since we've been together here to talk about Deep Space Nine, something that we've both been wanting to do very much for a long time, but circumstances have kept us off mic. We're planning to record more shows now and... For the first one here, we thought it would be nice to just get together and instead of having our usual tightly focused show about Minutia, we'll just chat about Deep Space Nine and about why it remains so important to both of us and why it endures and why it's becoming possibly more popular than ever right now. Yeah, I mean, and this was something that I was, uh, you know, when you mentioned this as an idea, I thought it was a really fun way to just kind of dive back into, you know, recording with the orb. Um, and, you know, uh, both you and I, I think, are, are on track right now. We're, we're definitely doing some rewatches of Deep Space Nine. I'm in season two, kind of midway through season two. I know you, uh, you were, I think you just said you were finishing season one up. You know, so uh, which is always fun to kind of go back through the show, and and I've been doing it slowly. I haven't been super binging it, um, so just kind of in savoring watching, uh, you know, just one episode at a time, and that's been really great. But it's something that you mentioned, I thought was really interesting, and and you were rewatching the documentary. You said, yeah, and you had come across uh, just a really interesting tidbit of information that you know we get from I- Iris Stephen Bear about something that Mike Pillar had told him uh, about uh, you know writing Star Trek and it- it's something to which you know when you mentioned that i felt like wow this really encapsulates i think the reason to which deep space 9 has continued to be a show. So I, I'd love I think that's a really good place to start. So so mm. you you were just watching it. What was that quote? Yeah. So we got to a point where uh Iris talking about Michael Pillar and his influence, you know, as a co creator of the show and his influence on the writers. And you know it's interesting with Ira, one thing that we forget, I think, is that the Ira Stephen Bear that we know and think of today is a much more mature and experienced writer than he was right. in the early days of Deep Space Nine. Not that he wasn't already excellent, of course, but he grew through Star Trek as well. And Michael Piller's influence was quite important. And in the documentary, Ira says that Michael would talk to the writers about character development and really going deep into the characters to bring out something that maybe the viewer hadn't thought of 
letting the viewer get to know the characters, and he said plot was always secondary. Plot only existed to reveal and explain character. And I thought, you know, that that's the key, really, I think, to why I continue to love Deep Space Nine, to why it became my favorite Star Trek, even though I grew up on the original series and The Next Generation started when I was finishing high school. So DS9 was certainly not in any way my first Trek, but became my favorite. And the reason that I think it endures and its popularity has continued to grow as people watch it is because of this. Characters drive this story. Mm -hmm. It's a big, grandiose story about a man who doesn't want to be in his posting, who becomes a religious icon about an epic war between the Federation, uh, not only the Federation, but the Alpha Beta powers combined against an enemy who wants to take over from the Gamma Quadrant. And yet, underneath it all, it's always about the characters. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was something that I think, you know, I've I've been seeing myself, you know, in I think it just television in general. And, and as we have gone towards the, the shorter run series, there has been such a worry, I think, uh, about, you know, how tightly plotted can we make this and everything. And everything seems to become about the plot and and one of the things and i was actually mentioning this with uh somebody i I feel like we're dming on twitter you know talking about this idea and you know one of the things i think having 24 episodes a season gave you the the time to explore and find out what worked what characters worked what character pairings worked find out things about the characters you might not know as a writer because you have time because you're basically trying to fill time you know and in that it gives you an opportunity to kind of really mold and shape in a way that you don't get to do when you're just trying to cram everything into 12 episodes or 10 episodes and you're trying to make sure you have a full-on story being told and it always have to has to be some sort of epic arc you know that happens like every season has to be bigger than the next and there doesn't seem to be as much focus then on the characters as those shows where some of the episodes meander. Some of the episodes, you know, you may get uh, far beyond the stars and then, you know, you may get profit and lace. But both episodes are born of having the opportunity to really explore uh, the show, what it is, the characters in the show. And I think that's just something that's um, really special. And I, and I think you can tell that Star Trek Deep Space Nine is driven by the characters because when you look at every single choice they make, the characters that become more a part of the story are are so many of them not even a part of the main cast. They're characters to which the writers found by falling in love with them themselves and then using them yeah. con- continuously. And I think that there's just something that's really neat about that. And we were kind of talking before in the show, and I was just thinking, you know, the shows that people go back to and rewatch. So many people go back to because they fell in love with the characters. And yes, the story is a big part of that, you know, the plot of where the characters go. But if the characters themselves continue to to be enjoyable and be worth uh, investing your time in, and their story then happens to be one that leads you to a place where they kind of, quote unquote, have some sort of happy end or a good end. You know, those are the shows to which you want to go back and rewatch over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of like big epic shows that have just come out, you know, in the last 10 years or whatever. And, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons that like Game of Thrones was so successful is because it was based on a book series to which had so much depth for character. Mm-hmm. And so you're pulling from that. And I do think that many of the shows that we see today, they kind of lose that. And um, it's something to which I think I've seen even recently, like I'll call out a successful show in that is I feel like The Mandalorian has done a pretty good job of creating characters to which you're interested to see where they go. And it's not just about plot. It's about 
what situations the characters get themselves in. Um, Mm -hmm. And each week, you're just kind of interested to see what's going to happen to that favorite character. So, yeah, I think that's just something that's, you know, obviously Mike Piller knew what he was doing because he helped create two incredible Star Trek shows. Three, actually, because Voyager, too, you know, so... Yeah, The Mandalorian is an interesting example because I feel like The Mandalorian is a throwback. Yep, yep, it, I think you're right. It feels like a show from the 90s with modern tools, uh, cinematic tools, you know, modern way of producing television. But the storytelling itself feels a lot more kind of like a DS9, mm-hmm. really, because... There, like, there's a thread that runs through the episodes, but each episode feels more standalone. Yeah, for the most part. Now, I don't know how season two plays out because I'm only in the third episode of season two. But season one, I very much felt that way, and I thought about other shows that I enjoyed from the past, like Stargate, Atlantis, for example, which was a show that I was really into for a while, and that kind of storytelling where there is a thread running through but you can go to individual episodes and watch them and and rewatch them and really enjoy them and you know which episode it is that's the thing with next generation of course original series but next generation ds9 yep. voyager enterprise any of those series you know the events that happened that's that episode title that's that mm-hmm. episode title like you know where it falls and i think in modern storytelling in multiple franchises we don't necessarily know that because the story is just there's this like frantic push to get to the end of the plot and so you miss that character development if i think about the next generation in ds9 both are series that I love to go back and rewatch episodes over and over and over. And the contrast between those two series, which were developed back to back and, and overlapped, is that the depth of the storytelling in DS9 is so much deeper. There's so many layers to what's going on. So if I feel like I really want to analyze something and I really want to think and maybe feel find a thread I didn't recognize before in a story to stimulate myself, I'll turn on a DS9 episode. And if I want to relax a bit more, I want that comfort food of Star Trek, then I'll turn on a Next Generation episode. That's sort of, for me, a bit of the contrast. So they're very similar in the way they tell stories, but the the depth of the layers is very different. And again, I think for me, if I'm thinking about why do I hang on to DS9, why does my love for the show keep growing? That's a key reason. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that really kind of sticks out to me with uh, the show as well, that on top of of characters to which people can continue to love, and and I, I think, you know, I can't undersell how important that is just because... You know, when I think of the, the beauty of this show is that it gives you the opportunity to, to kind of watch from so many different perspectives because there are so many characters that we watch. It gives us the opportunity to be like, oh, my gosh, I could completely rewatch this show and try and watch it through the perspective of so many different characters. And I think that's something to me that's that's quite interesting is that that's not normal that you would have this many characters that you could really watch a show through, through their eyes. And so I think that's something that's quite special. I could rewatch Deep Space Nine and it, and I want to get the perspective of Garrick or I want to get the perspective of Quark or I want to get the perspective of Lita. And, you know, again, you, you could continue to go through over and over again in your rewatch and really just trying to pinpoint the character arc and the character growth for each one of uh, if not 20 to 25 characters right and i think that Mm -hmm. that's something that's pretty special but at the same time i think through that every choice that they make story-wise enhances these characters 
it's not just that we're trying to get from point A to point B. And so, therefore, characters are really just pieces on a chessboard that have to get moved in a certain way. All of these characters, and again, I think this has to do with the 24 episodes, you really have the time to kind of figure out what's working best in your storytelling and then come up with ideas to which, like, oh, man, well, we could do this or we could do this, Mm -hmm. you know. And so I I think there's a a much more organic nature to – the character storytelling, but with Deep Space Nine, you can legitimately tell everything is driven by those characters and not by needing to reach a certain plot point. Right. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, you know, they, they did have 26 episodes, actually, to work with on this series, and... Man, I totally forgot that, like, which because it's well, such anathema today to have that many episodes, you know? Well, I think I, I was thinking that maybe one reason that you you said twenty four is because we usually got two duds in a season at some point, oh, like well. Prophet and Lace. No, and- I was just forgetting that there are that many episodes, which again, you know, today yeah. is just quite it, yeah, it you, just nothing. You, just you would never see that. that. Yeah, exactly. That's just not how the the television model works these days, and and I think twenty six is maybe a few too many because you could feel sometimes like they've they've got to somehow oh sure 26 hours and not every story is great and we've talked about this before i'm pretty sure we've talked about it on here i know we've talked about it on other shows about like what would be the right number of episodes but what i find interesting is because i've thought about this quite a lot and i thought about if you remove the episodes in a given season of Deep Space Nine, which are maybe they they feel like filler. There aren't a lot of them, but they're there here and there in a season. If you remove that stuff, if if you if you reduce the number of episodes that they had to say, you know, eighteen, for example, I still feel like this group of writers, because they're so focused on character, they would still find a way to deeply develop the characters. Even if they only had 10 episodes, I think they would find a way to deeply develop the characters. Maybe the scope of the story would be a bit different. And the way that you approach the planning of the story would be different. But I think some of it is just what is important to the writer. Is it the plot or is it the character? And one thing on Deep Space Nine, though, because they did have that time, and we've also talked about before, is that they would dangle threads, right? Like, maybe we could go here, maybe we could go there. And sometimes they would pull a thread and advance a storyline, and sometimes they would just let that go. And maybe you don't even think about it until you go back and you rewatch four, five, six times, and then you notice that there was this thing that was heading in some direction, and then... We never came back to it, right? Because they had the time to do that. But Mm -hmm. still, even in all those cases, I feel like the characters are what was driving the idea. They talk about this in the documentary as well when they talk about Odo and Kira getting together. And they say that, you know, we, we never planned for the two of you to become a couple. Like, you guys made the couple because we just saw the interaction on the screen when you're acting together. And we thought it seems like Kira gets lighter when she's around Odo and Odo's looking longingly at Kira. It's just there. So that that chemistry drives a plot without it being planned. And, and uh, I'm rambling a little bit here, but I think again, the reason that connects with me watching Deep Space Nine is because it's more like real life. You know, life mm-hmm. takes yeah. us in different yeah. directions that we don't anticipate. Yep. Yeah. I, no, I, I, I don't, I don't really conceive of this as as being something where you're you're rambling because I think what you are saying is is that, and what we are seeing is that there is this organic nature to the storytelling. And that organic nature is leading us to uh, see characters in these different lights. And even it's it's enabling the writers to be able to respond to what's happening on screen. And again, you mentioned the idea like, yeah, 24, uh, 26 episodes, probably maybe too long. 
But at the same time, I think those episodes gave them the opportunity to spend time with the characters in a way that allowed them uh, to see things that worked and what didn't work. And sometimes things really worked between these characters and you got to see that because you were seeing the way that the actors after 26 episodes were kind of spending time with one another. You know, like you said, even just the way that they're just looking at one another um, mm-hmm. ha- ha- has a has a big impact. And, and so to me, I think there's something pretty cool about that that, again, doesn't happen when you, you have – less time Mm -hmm. and you know it's not to put down anyone or or anything about you know what what writers do now it's a is a terribly difficult job what they do so i don't i don't want anybody to think that i'm 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 trying to put them down in any way shape or form but i just think it is it is fascinating to me that this is such a big focus uh and and something that you pulled out that was really getting to me but Mm -hmm. you know i i do think and I think we've probably mentioned it, you know, before many a times here on on the show. There is something beautiful about the way Deep Space Nine's storytelling happens as well. On top of character, it never felt reactionary to the time period that we are in specifically. And without that reaction being there, you know, without that, mm-hmm. um, just like oh we have to tell a story about this because it just it speaks to our time you know deep space 9 it was it, it's it's a little bit more timeless and and that timelessness mm-hmm. helps it stand the test of time because you can watch it and be able to put on it many different things and you know again we've mentioned this many a times before on this show but i think it just bears repeating because it is really important and it it's one of the reasons why people continue to find Star Trek Deep Space Nine and you know even when I think about you watching the documentary and then being able to do that documentary and why were they able to do that documentary because so many people gave money over and over and over again so they could do it the way they did even when I remember they came back and asked for more money because they wanted to do all the footage in HD yeah. And they did they did most of the footage in HD that they uh, so they they did they were able to get that work done. To me that's just fascinating and it's because so many people found this show later. It, they found it in syndication or they found it on Netflix, you know. And so I think it, it, that comes down to the fact that people could could still connect with these characters and the show because there was a sense of timelessness about what they were watching that speaks to us because it continues to speak to us right and there's nothing wrong with telling stories that are connected with what's happening in the here and now and star trek has done that you know certainly episodes of the original series are commentaries on what was happening in the real world at that time and same for the next generation but overall i would say all of those series tos tng DS9, Voyager, Enterprise, they tell, they are social commentary on a broader scale about the human condition, which we keep repeating as a civilization. We keep repeating the same things over and over, certain aspects of how we are as a society. And those broader social commentary messages deliver content episodes that are, as you say, a bit more timeless. And, and sometimes they become prophetic. You know, you look at past tense on DS9 and them predicting what the world would be like in 2020. And they weren't predicting a pandemic or anything, but when they talk about sort of just the general state of society does look a bit like today and that's a case of not being a ripped from the headlines type of story, although the problem of homelessness at the time obviously spurred them to think about what it might be like in the future. But because you can watch it today and you can still find those connections to the current world, and sadly, you'll probably be able to watch that episode 
20 years from now and still feel like it's speaking to what's happening in the world. Uh, that That is one thing that stands out to me with DS9. And, you know, for me, Star Trek has always been about social commentary. And another thing I loved about Deep Space Nine, TNG, the original series, is the the scope, like the, the broad brush, is so many topics. It's why I love science fiction literature. You can pull a short story, you can pull a novel about so many different topics. And that's uh, another reason that maybe the more expansive nature of storytelling on TV in the 90s that we got in Star Trek uh, still connects with me very well. And I think with so many fans, there's a lot of variety within the seasons. Yeah, and I think... One of the interesting things that I think we're hitting on is is uh, just uh, the theme of why character matters, you know, uh, in storytelling. Why character is is I think paramount. You know, uh, they they say that for anything, context is king. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think for for storytelling and TV shows, what I see here and what we get you know, from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, I think character is king. Um, And if we're going to tell stories, we have to have characters to which we're invested in to tell us those stories. And the stories that you keep going back to over and over again tend to be those. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I personally, you know, every few years I reread The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, because I love spending time with these characters, right? Why mm-hmm. do people go back to reread the the you know Harry Potter? Because they love the characters, you know. And J.K. Rowling knew the plot of that story, but she never sacrificed character to tell the story. And and so I think that's one of the things that we're kind of getting at. And and and. What makes Deep Space Nine so special is that I don't feel like they ever sacrifice character to tell their stories. Like I, one of the things that I was thinking of as 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 how important, and this is something you know that obviously uh, Sirach Lofton and uh, Avery Brooks have talked about extensively. For them, it was showing father and a son relationship, and that that father son relationship was kind of the uh honestly the e ching of deep space nine for them it was the story that they were telling but in many ways deep space nine also allows us to see not so good fathers because i was thinking the juxtaposing that with Worf. you know we have this storyline mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. cng that kind of gets tossed around to and fro with that series but here it gets dealt with Worf's ineffectiveness as a father his terrible parenting um you know mm-hmm. but we actually use that as a story point and and part of that what makes that such a, such a successful story point then is because we are allowed to juxtapose that with what we've seen as a really good father on the show and so again you know all of these story points and i think you know when i think through deep space nine and all of the challenges that the show had to go through i mean they were literally thrown wharf because they were made to bring Worf in, but they made the best mm-hmm. out of the storyline. It pushed an entire storyline for them, plot that they had been building to a whole other season, but they had to make it work. You know, the same thing with Jadzia Dax leaving, right? You have to make the best of the situation that you're given. So when I think through all of these different issues, in the end, they try to make sure that their plot that they're telling works for the characters. So I I think that that's something that's really smart. I mean, gosh, it's something that every great storyteller does, you know, from any good TV writer to any good movie writer to any good book writer. If you're telling a story, you want it to be in a way that brings people in. And the best way to bring people in is by having them fall in love with your creation. And that's usually with your creation of a character. Mm -hmm. And having such a wide range of characters like DS9 did gives everybody someone to latch on to that they identify with. That's a really good point, too. I mean, I I don't think you can oversell how important that was for Deep Space Nine to have so many different characters that people could fall in love with, not just one. Yeah, because I mean... That's really important. Like, if you're really the silent type, you've got Morn, 
you know, he's just it's very true. It, there's it's so something true for everybody. So um, while we're talking about father son relationships, you know, don't overlook the Ram Nog relationship on DS9 either. You know, very sort true. of in between, you know, That's such a good point. Ram, Ram didn't know how to be a father in the way that Benjamin did, but he tried to be a good father to Nog and tried to encourage Nog to find his own path the way that, that Benjamin let Jake find his own path also. Mm-hmm. And, and that turns out to be a great relationship. You know, like mm-hmm. it's not the same, but it shouldn't be, you know, they're different. And and can I just say, you know, I really thank you for bringing that up because it made me think of something that I had been thinking about. And that one of the things that, that Star Trek Deep Space Nine, I think, truly did was how do we live with people that are completely different than us and learn yeah. to, to love them for who they are? And I was specifically thinking of Jadzia's relationship with the Ferengi. Yeah. You know, she doesn't negate the fact that Ferengi have many issues, but she also learns to love them for who they are and accept them for who they are. But she also doesn't tolerate things that she finds completely out of line, right? Like there's a, there's a, there's a limit. So I, there's a real beauty here because I think Star Trek Two Space Nine is, is Star Trek's best look at true diversity and what it means to have true diversity of thought, true diversity of character, and true diversity of just diversity. You know, we see that with the different people that we have on the show. And I think it does it really well, but it does it in a very unobtrusive way. It's not in your face. Yeah. or yeah. It's just, again, it's woven into the storytelling of Star Trek D Space Nine. And I was just really thinking about that because, you know, I feel like, Today, so much of storytelling is is trying to uh, to just show us, you know, bad things or bad types of characters or whatever, and and we immediately kind of just see them as bad. No, you wouldn't. You want to do that, but here, yeah, we're seeing flawed characters, and yes, we might not want to emulate all Ferengi behavior, right? But what do we see by people not just immediately pushing them away? our Ferengi characters, many of them change. They grow. They mature. Well, Quark especially, you know, Quark changes greatly over the course of the series. He's still Quark, but he's a different Quark by the end uh, who really cares about people in a way he didn't at the beginning. But yeah, it's a good point. I mean, that's one of the, the, the... clearest differences between the next generation and DS9, that transition, that TNG has many wonderful messages about accepting others. And we've got all different alien races in the Federation. And the ultimate message of Star Trek in TOS and TNG is diversity, itic, infinite diversity in infinite combinations and accepting others. But the setting in which we see the characters is very different. Deep Space Nine, the station, is a way station. And by its very nature, after the Cardassians leave especially, is having aliens coming through the wormhole. And this is their first point of entry. You know, this is the, this is the rest area. When you cross into Florida and you get your free orange juice when I was a kid <laughs> and you pick up... You know, 30 brochures of places that you can visit that you dump in the floorboard of the car. You know, this that's what DS9 is, except the the diversity of the aliens that are there is incredible. And that's something that you don't see on a Federation starship because maybe on the Enterprise, you know, you've got a hundred species serving aboard the ship. But the difference is they've all gone to Starfleet Academy. They've all become part of this one organization and they have to live in a structure where they have a captain and they have commanders above them and they're expected to do things by the book and everything is squeaky clean. And then they go and they encounter other people, but within their environment, there's 
diversity, but it's a, a sort of a controlled diversity because they're all part of this one organization, Starfleet. Whereas Deep Space Nine is, as they set the show up to be, more like the Wild West. The rules are not clear. You've got a tug of war between Starfleet rules, Bajoran rules, Odo's own rules. No rules. Yeah. Odo's rules Quartz are their rules, own rules you know? in and of themselves. <laughs> Uh, and so it's more like the real world. It's like a real city where you have to learn to live with other people who are different than you are. And, you know, ultimately everyone wants to, pretty much everyone wants to be happy and, and live a happy and successful life and have friends and, and help other people when they can and and be accepting of others. And And so I think DS9 does provide within Star Trek, the best environment to tell those types of stories and and those messages. And also the fact that the nature of the storytelling is shades of gray. We're not getting this, this is right, this is wrong. Of course, there are some things that are clearly wrong, but there are many things that some people consider wrong that other people don't. And, and we, we see that explored throughout the stories of ds9 yeah i i think um you know it just i can't think it it just can't be overstated how it is is that it, it really is the truest diversity i think that we've seen in in star trek in that sense of what it truly means to live with people who aren't required to live by your rules, right? That aren't required to live by your moral code. You know, um, yes, we're on a Bajoran station where we're supposed to all be living by these Bajoran rules, but that sometimes gets tweaked, you know, that, that and then there are yeah. people like, again, like the Ferengi who aren't trying to live by your rules at all. And, and so you have to deal with that. And, and so I think there really is this sense of there's this sense of beauty i think of of what it means to truly be diverse and really what it truly means to accept people even people you don't agree with even people you might not even like you know like this is this is what i think true infinite diversity and infinite combinations means um and and what did what do we see i mean one of the episodes we we talked about last was, you know, the one where you had the assassination attempt. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, basic. Oh, in the hands of the prophets. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and these ideas of, of like, you know, um, trying to really shut down any speech we don't like. Whereas mm-hmm. Deep Space Nine says, no, the, the answer to, to speech you don't like is more speech. It's 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 speech that that helps show where that might be wrong. And and so I just there's a real beauty to Deep Space Nine. And I think it comes from the storytelling. It comes from the characters um, and it comes from the ability to tell stories to which character comes first. And and I I really, you Mm -hmm. know, I really love that, you know, when you you had this idea of like talking about the series that we were able to, that you would hit on this idea, you know, from Mike Pillar, because uh, I think Mike Pillar's absolutely right. And I think absolutely, if there's one thing that I think makes Deep Space Nine stand the test of time, it is this idea of, of character. And one other thing there, talking about speech, and if there's someone saying something that you don't like, and I'm not talking about hate speech and that kind of thing, I'm talking about normal, just normal opinions, but you don't personally agree with that opinion. What we see in DS9 is, uh, maybe I shouldn't even use the word opinion. I I should use the word opinion, but I should also maybe think of it in a sense of belief systems as well, uh, because that episode is about science and faith and how you know, Keiko believes in science and and Wynn believes in faith and there's a, a conflict over that. And then there's the other plot with the assassination attempt because the election for Kai is coming up. And of course, Wynn doesn't want uh, the Federation there in the first place. But 
In that and overall in Deep Space Nine, I think one thing that we see is the idea of finding common ground. I think that's what a healthy society needs is people to have the ability to talk to each other. There's always going to be a center and then from that center, people are going to be in different positions in terms of what they, they believe. And most, most people are complex. They're not black and white in their beliefs. And so what you have to be able to do is to talk to each other and find common ground because most of us have plenty of things that we agree on. And then we have some points on which we don't agree. And living aboard that space station, you have to do that. Like you can't live on DS9 if you can't find common ground with people because there is so much diversity of thought aboard the station. And again, that's the thing you don't find on a Federation starship like the Enterprise or Voyager because everyone aboard the ship is part of Starfleet. Even the people on Voyager who were Maquis and maybe were never Starfleet officers, now they're part of Starfleet. Now they have to play by Starfleet rules if they want to stay on the ship. And so you just, you don't have as much of a need to find that common ground. But in the real world, you do. And on the station, you do. Well, I think you made a great point there because uh, when you think about it, we're on a Bajoran station. So it's Bajoran rules, not Federation rules, right? You know, they work together, but, but they they don't always see eye to eye on, on what those things are supposed to be either. So you're absolutely right. Right. And, but the interesting point there is that Kira never tries to force everybody on the station right. to follow Bajoran rules or beliefs. And Cisco never tries to force everyone on the station to follow Starfleet rules or beliefs. There are some Starfleet security rules that maybe, yeah, you need to follow these rules because they're there for a really good reason. They're there mm -hmm. to keep you alive, basically. But when it comes to beliefs, no one on that station is trying to force everybody to follow one set of beliefs or one point of view. Right. Uh, the, the people in charge are encouraging everyone to find common ground, get along with each other, and create uh, maybe a richer community. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is absolutely the case. It's a beautiful thing, and I think, you know, it's what makes Deep Space Nine, as we've been kind of talking about, stand the test of time. And I think it's exciting because, um, uh, you know, I know we're we're definitely excited about the opportunity to, to continue to talk about the show here. And it's what has made it a joy to rewatch over and over and over again, as I have. And even just kind of going through this very slow rewatch and it was making me even appreciate, you know, we've talked before, you know, about season one, but. I was really struck by um, rewatching season one, actually how I think it's one of the better first seasons out there. And part of that is because so much character work is already happening in the show. And that's something that is really special. And, and again, was immediately setting it apart from its predecessor, TNG. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, and I think that's why on a first viewing often people feel like that season is weak, especially in first run when we all saw it the first time happening live coming off TNG and TNG was still in the air because the type of storytelling maybe didn't connect with people as much. The stories on the next generation at the same time maybe were a little more exciting for Star Trek fans than what was happening on Deep Space Nine where you had... Some stories that felt kind of like TNG, but in a little bit different setting. It wasn't different enough. But like you say, when you rewatch it now, when you know how the story plays out, you can really see a lot of the character development that's already underway in season one. And maybe some of the focus on that is why on the first viewing, maybe the episodes seem a bit slow or they're not quite as interesting, but they're far more interesting when you can see those seeds being planted. Yeah. And it, honestly, there's there's no other show in Star Trek that I've watched as much or continue to rewatch. And in all honesty, the one that's closest to it is is actually Enterprise because of that reason, too. Mm -hmm. I think Enterprise really followed the same model that Deep Space Nine did was that they wanted to have their show 
be somewhat standalone episodes, but they were also not afraid to continue the character growth that was happening in every episode and reference things that had happened in previous episodes. So, Mm -hmm. um, to me, those two shows really understood this idea of walking the line, the fine line between the balance of trying to be standalone enough, but yet at the same time continue to have the character development and storytelling structure to which makes you want to keep coming back over and over and over again, um, where you have these overarching arcs, overarching themes, and, you know, kind of an overarching story from start to finish for the series itself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm the same with Enterprise. All right. Well, this has been fun. You know, it's just a kind of a casual chat, touch on a few topics here, largely characters being the theme. And from here, we'll jump into some of our more specific topics, talking about all the seasons of DS9 here on the Orb. So I'm looking forward to doing that with you, Matthew. Yeah, I am too. You know, I think, uh, you know, if you're listening to the show, you can tell how much we love this show and how much we still love talking about it. And and so, yeah, we hope to definitely be back much more regular than we have been. Um, and we're working towards that. But this is this is our way of saying, uh, you know, we're here. We still absolutely adore this show. And we can't wait to continue to, to talk about it with you. Um, so, Chris, you know, if, if maybe um, people wanted to catch up with you and and talk about some star trek deep space nine where can they find you well the best place to find me is twitter that's where i am the most active and my username there is c brian jones letter c and brian with a y and i am doing my ds9 rewatch right now i did one last year as well i just I got into january and i thought you know it's new year it's time to do another ds9 rewatch and so i've started on season one again. I'm also watching other Star Trek series and I usually tweet out uh, what I'm watching and then sometimes make comments along the way, depending on whether I'm also working while I'm watching or if I'm seriously watching. So that's uh, the best place. And uh, you can also find me roaming around from time to time in the Babel Conference on Facebook. That is our private listeners group for Trek FM listeners. So if you're not already a member, We invite you to come over there and join in the conversation with us and fellow listeners. You can find that on Facebook by typing Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field. It should come up. If not, just type the whole name, The Babel Conference. I would like to point out it is a group for our listeners. It's not just a random general Facebook group. And therefore, we do ask you two questions when you try to join the group. One is, what's your favorite podcast? And the other is, where did you hear about The Babel Conference? And then we do ask you to agree to the rules of the forum. And you need to do all three of those things or else I can't let you in. I've got a number of people who are waiting in a queue right now because they don't answer the questions or they don't agree to the terms. Um, it's it's pretty simple. It's a little box that pops up. So do that. But we'd love to see you there. And you can also talk to us on Twitter as a network at TrekFM. That's our username there. And if you want to send us email You can also do that by just going to the website and using the contact form that you find there. So, Matthew, how about you? You know, when you're not uh, doing your endless rewatches of Deep Space Nine, counting down the episodes until Esri arrives, where can people find you? Yeah, um, the best places uh, is, you know, social media. Look for Matt Rushing Zero Two. Uh, If I'm on the platform, you'll find me. Uh, so, you know, catch up with me on Twitter and all those other places. You can find me there. Uh, here on the network, doing the 602 Club, which is our general geek show talking about all of the fandoms we love. Uh, you can follow that on Twitter at the 602 Club. And, of course, we have a new show that's going to be dropping soon. John Mills and I are working on that called Snyder Cuts. And uh, that's going to be talking about uh, the directorial works of Zack Snyder one episode at a time it's gonna be really fun uh and um yeah that's where we promise you we're going to be growing the 602 club side of the network and so that's part of that and i'm really excited that that's happening um and then of course you could find me over on the nerd party network doing a couple of shows 
One is called Outpost, which Rick Kaufman, as we're actually wrapping up the Harry Potter series. We've been walking through it one chapter at a time. And then John Mills and I talk about Star Wars every week on Aggressive Negotiation. So check us out there. And of course, uh, Chris, both you and I have been hard at work as well, uh, making sure that people still have literary tracks coming to, which is about the books and the comics of Star Trek. So, so much happening here, not only on the network, but uh, in both of our lives. So yeah, we'd love for you to, to check us out or enjoy us on Twitter. And of course, you know, we do want to say a huge thank you, you know, to our associate producers there, Chris, through Patreon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much to everyone who's supporting us through Patreon. We are doing our best to retool the network here, doing a bit of a relaunch and a rebranding. It's been a very tough year uh, financially for the network with the, the coronavirus crisis, pandemic, all that's been going on in everyone's lives. But if you would like to support us, you can become an associate producer of the show, of the network. You can take part in the patrons roundtables, which we will be starting back up again, as well as some other activities that we're going to be launching to get everyone together to talk about and enjoy Star Trek. And you can find out about that over at patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. And we really appreciate all your help there. It's the only way that we can keep the network going. And uh, Matthew, you mentioned literary treks, and yeah, it's been so much fun talking books and comics again with you after a a long break, uh, for me, several years break on that front. And I didn't mention earlier, I do have some other podcasts here on the network. Most of my podcasts are on a just occasional release schedule at the moment, but I hope to be ramping those up again soon now that my long-awaited work transition has begun here in January. One of those is The Edge, where I talk about Star Trek Discovery. And there's also Interphase, which is a new Star Trek Universe podcast that I started late last year. I'm going to be doing new episodes of that. And there's The Ready Room, where Larry Nemechek and I get together to talk about Star Trek from time to time. And we'll be doing a new episode of that show pretty soon as well. And so lots of stuff for you to listen to and hopefully much more to come as we wrap up the network. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time as we gaze into the orb.